Good evening. <coughs> and welcome for those who are here for the first time. <coughs> My name is Rona and uh, tonight's topic is on karma. <laughs> How does it work? <coughs> the theme for tonight. And uh, this word karma is uh, much used, much misused, much abused word. <laughs> and uh, maybe even many times misunderstood word. So what we will try and do tonight is to get a bit of a more clear picture of what this really means. The word karma actually literally means action. And the word kar means hand. <coughs> but before we go into the specifics and the details, let us try and grasp and understand a bigger picture and uh, nature and the nature of life in general. And before we go into this... Uh, specific laws. Now if we, uh, if we observe nature, if we observe certain dynamics in nature, we see that nature actually <coughs> tries to give us a life of, what is it, comfort? <laughs> nature has many balancing dynamics and balancing factors. And uh, to give a simple example, if you cut your hand, what will happen? Bleeding and then? Hmm? It will start healing. And so you would do a certain action <coughs> and the, 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 the dynamics of the skin and the physiology of the skin is such that it will work to heal that wound. Um, <coughs> wants to be our friend. Nature wants to give us a life of certain comfort. Nature works in our, uh, helps us to survive. Now, if you truly, f simple example is this body. If you look at the dynamics of the body, there is such a delicate mechanism. The, the, the hormonal systems, the physiological systems, and they all are working for you to have a proper functioning body and a proper physical experience through the body. If you know how these eyes work, <laughs> this is such an intricate mechanism that is there. And if there is some damage, many mechanisms work to repair it and to restore things, to give your, uh, to enhance your experience. Um, nature has all these, uh, what would you call them, patterns? in place and nature wants us to live according to those patterns. If we live according to those patterns, if we live um, in aligned with those patterns, then things will go well. <coughs> nature w ha works for our survival and works for our comfort. Now in such a nature, there is also the phenomena of pain. True? Now how can you rhyme that with friendly nature? Hmm? Warning? <laughs> Question? Maybe you can move the chair. 
little bit that we can all see. <laughs> no, it's okay. No. Any thoughts? No, it's okay. <laughs> you were sitting okay. He moved. <laughs> Any thoughts? Now, if you observe the, the dynamics of nature, you see there are constructive processes, there are processes that are destructive, and there are processes that sustain things. Now, for example, the skin, every moment there are, is the production of new skin cells. And every moment there is also the destruction of old skin cells. They are shed. And there are processes that keep the, that balance so that they are not more shed than produced or not more produced than shed. If that balance is out of order, there will be more productions of cells and there will be, there will be a lump. Some tumor will grow. So those balancing factors are there to, pr to create an equilibrium in what is produced and what is uh, discarded of. Nature has these intricate dynamics, but nature also has the phenomena of pain. We agree with that? Anyone has not experienced that? <laughs> now, in such a, a context, why is that, that nature is there? If nature works for our benefit, if nature exists to make our life comfortable, why is there the phenomena of pain? And maybe that phenomena of pain is there, as was mentioned already, um, to warn us. If you're, you're sitting down in a chair now, and if you're sitting in a wrong posture, what will happen? You will get pain. No? Now, what is that pain telling you? Wrong posture. <laughs> <laughs> change your posture. And if you change it in another wrong posture, then somewhere else will start painting. No? Until you sit in the right posture, then your sitting will be comfortable and there will be no pain. I'm simplifying things. So this phenomena of pain is part of nature's way to communicate with you. When? When? When you are doing something wrong. When you are adopting a wrong posture. Now, this is very un easy to understand uh, when you're sitting down and you're sitting in a wrong posture. But there may be many areas where we do not recognize the mechanism where we do not recognize even the form of pain. And when we have that pain, we do not necessarily associate it with the action we are performing. No, so in this uh, understanding of karma and how karma work, there might be many areas that we need to educate ourselves on. And if we educate ourselves, we might be able to shift things. Now, to give another example, <coughs> in the uh, prior to 1962, the cancer of the bronchus, bronchus, that is how you say it, bron no, not bronchitis, the bronchus, the not the esophagus, the, the bronchus. <laughs> the, 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 not the trachea, yes, this part, but the bronchus. Yeah, the tubes that uh, form your lungs. Anyway, cancer of that, 
excuse me, my English is not my mother tongue. <clears throat> Cancer of the bronchus was increasing, and they were not knowing why. And in 1963, 62, there was a publication of a studies that showed that people who were smoking, the first big uh, uh, research publication, that people who were smoking had 27 times more cancer of the bronchus than people who were not smoking. So all the other factors were the same, life were going on, just those who were smoking had 27 times more chance of getting developing cancer. And when this became known, 80% of the doctors stopped smoking. Not just because they knew. They were seeing a certain phenomena, cancer of the bronchus, but they did not know the connection, what was going on behind it. So when you know, when you are educated, you are much more uh, uh, motivated to change a habit, but also then you start knowing this is a habit that actually is not so healthy. No? <coughs> so in the same way, there are many things in life which may produce a certain discomfort, we, which may create misfortune for us, but we do not know. So when we talk about karma, we talk about bad action and good action, but maybe we don't even properly know what truly is a good action and what truly is a bad <laughs> action or an action that has certain consequence. The posture thing is easy. Now you sit wrong and you feel the pain. But for example, in relationships, there is emotional pain. There is emotional discomfort. We might not necessarily realize that there is an attitude, internal attitude in relationship that is the mental posture that produces that friction. We are not, what is it, trained, we are not conditioned to think in that way. And many times also we use this word karma to blame someone or something or ourselves, some wrong situation and say, oh, that is your karma. Means you were bad. <laughs> and this is why it is happening to you. But maybe it is just a wrong posture. There is a wrong physical posture, but there is a wrong mental posture. But if we are not educated about this, we don't know. And we don't know what to do about it either. And <clears throat> this mental posture, for example, in relationships, what would be a more appropriate posture to adopt in relationships so that there are less friction? In this world, one of the main dynamics in relationships going on is attachment and dependency. And then we call it with a nice fancy name, codependency. Maybe that is what is the attitude that can shift. But we are not even thinking along those lines often. There is just friction, and what is our solution? If it is too much, look for someone else. <laughs> that, is, uh, that is how we are conditioned to. If it becomes too much, if I can't handle it, if after some big fight things don't change, then you just go. But maybe there is something inside I can shift, inner posture. <coughs> Physical illness, apart from the obvious pain of a wrong physical posture, physical illness may be a wrong attitude in terms of lifestyle. The way we use this body and for what we use this body. 
maybe we can adopt our diet. That also is becoming more and more obvious, but <laughs> diet and lifestyle in general. Those are areas that we have not properly addressed. What is a lifestyle that is conducive for health of the body? <coughs> what is a diet that is conducive for health of the body? You want to say anything or share anything at this moment? Does it make some sense? And I'll give another simple example. If there is fire here, I like this example, fire here. Fire is very useful, isn't it? It produces heat. We are sitting here comfortable even though outside it is 30 something degree. <laughs> we are sitting here comfortable because there is this phenomenon. Nature pr gives us this thing called fire and heat. <coughs> There is light. Many of these things bring us comfort. There is fire. You can cook. You have your coffee and your what, your dinner because of heating mechanism. But if fire is here and I put my hand in that fire, that is not what I should be using that fire for. I am breaking the law of nature. I can use fire for many things, but not for putting my hand inside. So nature wants us to go along with the laws, and then nature will give us, will serve us. But if we break the laws, then nature says, this is not so. This is not so. Clever. <laughs> this is not so intelligent. This is not so wise. So I put my hand in, and what happens? Before it burns, pain. Yeah. And what is the message of that pain? Take your hand <laughs> This is not a place for your hand to be. But we have our own, what is this thing called? Um, freedom of choice. We have free will, and we also have this thing called uh, stubbornness sometimes. <laughs> we don't like to. <laughs> so we say, I do what I want. I keep my hand where I want it. So what will happen? More pain. <laughs> More pain until I learn. Then I say, oh, I will take some painkillers and I will take a few shots of whiskey and I will put on the television loud so that I can be distracted and I'll start planning my vacation for the summer. But I leave my hand there. What will happen? Pain will just get worse. Burning will happen. And even... I could lose the functions of the hand, ultimately. There is danger. That is why that pain is there. But I can be a little bit not so clever. I can be stubborn. I can be anything, but it will have consequences. Yes, I have free will to put my hand in fire. Yes, I have the free will to put my hand in fire as long as I want. Yes, I have the free will to even sit on that fire if I want. But nature will tell me, look, that is not so clever. But nature cannot talk. Nature's mechanism to communicate with us is through pain or comfort, no, either two. And then I can choose. So nature's way to, to uh, communicate with us about our wrong use of our free will is through the mechanism of pain and comfort. Understand? This is a bit bigger context of, of karma. <coughs>
And this dynamics works on all levels, not just at the physical level. It works at the emotional level, it works at the mental level, it even works at the spiritual level. If we approach things, if we approach relationships, if we approach health, if we approach wealth in a wrong internal posture, there will be pain. <coughs> but that pain is that pain is benevolent. That pain has the intention to balance you. That pain has the intention to shift you back into a posture that is more benevolent and beneficial for yourself. Now, problem in today's world is, or one of the problems in today's world is that there kind of is a thinking worldwide that things are just at random, that things just happen by chance, that there is no law or pattern behind it, and that you just have to do whatever and however and wherever and with whomever <laughs> for however long and get what you can get. Now, if that is my attitude, that is one way to deal with life. But maybe there is a more wiser way to live. And maybe that wiser way to live can give bigger, better results than just grabbing whatever I can, however. And <coughs> say for, well, in Manhattan there are not many gardens, but <laughs> if you go in some, <laughs> some, some garden and there are fruits there, they are not there just by chance. At some stage there was a seed and most probably the seed was planted by something, someone. And it is also not at random uh, whatever seed you plant, you will get a mango. No. You have to have the right seed to get a mango tree and to get mango fruit. No, it is not you can just sow some seed of wheat, some wheat, and you will get mango or, or apples. No. You have to plant the right seed to get the right desired fruit. No, and some seeds you plant tomato seeds, in three weeks you have a plant and it will start giving some fruit. Mango, if it is not manipulated, it will take you five years before that seed will grow into a tree that will give mangoes. If it is a coconut, if it is not manipulated, it might take 40, 50 years before it gives fruit. So <coughs> these things are not at random and life is not by chance. There are certain specific actions that lead to certain specific fruits. <coughs> but we are not, uh, our culture doesn't teach us to think like this and to see life in this way. <coughs> now, spiritual knowledge says nothing is at random. There is, everything has a pattern. And every outcome is because there was a certain seed. And those seeds you can sow now for what brings in the future. What was in the past is what I'm reaping now. But what is in the future is what I'm sowing now. But I need to be aware of what fruits I want. And if I know what fruits I want, I need to know which seeds <laughs> will give that fruit, isn't it? <coughs> 
It also tells us if we are reaping today, say we are harvest, harvesting bananas. It means banana seeds and banana plants were sown and planted. Now, if I want mango, I cannot continue to sow banana seeds, isn't it? Because I won't ever get mango. So in the same way, if the result of my life and my life situations and my life conditions at this moment in time are not completely to my liking, then I cannot continue to sow the same seeds that I have been sowing over the past period of time. If I continue to sow those same seeds at the level of consciousness, at the level of attitude, at the level of physical actions, if I continue to sow those same seeds, I will get the same fruits. Tomorrow, day after tomorrow, next year. <coughs> so this is like nice context to, to understand. It also gives you back the power of what goes on in your life and your experiences. It is not at random. It is not just by chance. And to go even further, one person may be born in a situation of difficult health or uh, lower socio-economic situations. And another person may be born in opposite situations. Spiritual knowledge says there are reasons for this. It is not at random or someone cruel decided you go there and you go there. There are patterns in nature. And there are patterns, and these patterns go back to the state of consciousness we are living in. Not just our attitude or our physical actions, but even deeper, what consciousness we are living in. <coughs> you want to say something at this moment or ask anything? Um, those systems are man-made and human-made. And what the law of karma says is there are universal dynamics. And if whatever man-made system there is, if it is in line with the, hum the, the universal natural laws, it will work and it will not give pain. And so some of the cultures or some of the systems or maybe many systems today in the human world, in different cultures, may be not in line anymore with natural laws. And that is why in this culture people have experiences of pain. And in another culture they also have. Maybe in different degrees or at different things, but we're all kind of in the same pot at the moment. No? Yeah, no, well, spiritual knowledge says there are factors, there are reasons for all of these things. Mm? But they are many times at an invisible level, 
and they are not at a level that we generally pay attention to. Many of us even don't pay attention to our thoughts. And we know there are different kinds of thoughts. We have constructive thoughts, we have elevated thoughts, we have destructive thoughts, we have negative thoughts. Even just a thought, just a simple example, if you whole day are creating thoughts of criticism and, and complaining, how will you feel at the end of that day? <laughs> so that mental posture that makes you create criticizing and complaining thoughts all the time, the fruit of that is you feel tired and drained and maybe even down and whatever, uh, negative and useless maybe also. So that in itself is already an action and its fruit at the level of thoughts. We are not even aware of that, let alone deeper factors that, that create our thoughts or that inspire certain thoughts. Now, <coughs> we'll try to simplify things. <coughs> if there is a wrong internal posture towards life, then that gives friction and situations. Now, how, what does, what creates that? What has happened? And let us try and grasp a bit of a more uh, big picture to what life and our life and our existence is all about from a spiritual perspective. No, spiritual knowledge says there is a physical dimension in the physical dimension, there's the body, there are objects. This is a house, not in Manhattan, but <laughs> it's supposed to be a house. <laughs> there is a job, there is money, there is some relationships, there is sound and music and entertainment and uh, education and culture, physical dimension. <coughs> and there is the one who is experiencing all of this, right? the being of consciousness. And the being of consciousness is a non-physical being, a spiritual being. And that being of consciousness visits the physical world, uses a body, travels in the physical world, and leaves the physical world. This is the uh, basics of spirituality. You can sit here if you want to. It's more easy to see or there are some chairs here. <coughs> this is clear? We will, so there are many words for this being of consciousness, soul or spirit. And in different languages, there are many names. But the inner being or the higher being, the experiencer, or soul. This being visits the physical world, travels and experiences, and leaves the physical world again. Now, when we talk about uh, deeper inner factors, then we talk about identity, or ego. This is the wrong color. <coughs> Our attitude towards this world in general. What would make us a fortunate or misfortunate? You see like that? Misfortunate? Misfortunate. That is also something that we sometimes feel it's just at random. Some people are fortunate, some people are lucky, and some people are not. And sometimes I am a little bit lucky, and other times I am not lucky. Misfortunate. Karma says there's no such thing. <laughs> it is not at random. There are reasons. 
And those reasons at a deeper level, at the seed level, can be in this wrong or right attitude towards this world. Now, if we look at this simplified image of life and of our experience, what could be an attitude that is um, in line with nature? Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? No? <laughs> the inner being is a visitor here. No? A visitor. Because visit means you come and you leave again. There is an exit. Now, do we behave like visitors here? <laughs> on earth? Do we behave as visitors on this planet? If we do, we behave like bad visitors. Hmm? Isn't it? <coughs> so we do not behave like visitors. We behave as if we can own things here. We behave as if Things here are mine and I can just use and do whatever and however. And not only that, we identify with it. Now they say pride comes before the fall. So we create ego and arrogance based upon these things. And maybe that is the wrong attitude. Internal attitude. We forgot that we are just visiting. And we create this feeling of mine, mine. We create expectations and demands and complaints and desires based on a temporary visit. And <laughs> <coughs> Whilst a visitor has a different attitude. A visitor has the attitude, oh, nothing here is mine. This is nice. They're giving me a chair. Oh, this is nice. There are, so ma there are flowers here, there is light. Oh, wow. There is a subtle sense of gratitude. There is a subtle sense of appreciation. There is a subtle sense of so many gifts. That is the attitude of a visitor. But the attitude of ego is, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, and I want some more also, and don't touch. <laughs> <coughs> and I need, and I need. And if I need, then I get anxious that I may not get. And I get stressed out, and just in case I want another one, so that if one gets lost, I have another one. So we enter into greed. So maybe that is the attitude towards life that we have created that makes us unfortunate. If there are two children here, and you have chocolates in your hand, you have some chocolates, and one says, give me, give me, give me, I need chocolates, I'm hungry, give me, give me, give me, give me. And the other child says, yes, give to him. Yes, give to him. He wants the chocolate, give all the chocolates to him. To whom do you want to give? <laughs> Even he says, give to him, but to whom do you want to give? And even if you give to the other one, your heart and your love and your appreciation will be for the one who can be humble and give to others and sacrifice. We naturally gravitate towards those who are giving and not demanding. Now maybe nature's law is to cooperate with those who have that natural visitor attitude of appreciation and gratitude and giving. 
and those who are demanding, they sooner or later, nature will start opposing. But li one moment, but, but, but like in the beginning I said, some seeds give fruits within three weeks. Some seeds give fruit after 40 years. So not every result comes immediately. So sometimes you see people who, in your perception of things, are not behaving well, but life goes well. And others who, in my perception of things, are behaving well, life may not go so well, but there are factors that are invisible inside, internal. Maybe it was very long ago, but that doesn't really matter. We can create that now, at least at the individual level. And maybe nature, life, environment, matter is telling us now more strongly than ever, you better change your attitude human beings otherwise, not otherwise, there are already <laughs> major problems that are accumulating. Now, when I was growing up, which was not that long ago, <laughs> when 40, 50 years ago someone gets can cancer, that was rare. And that was for people who are 70, 80, 90 years old. Now, to hear of an earthquake was once in I don't know how many years. So there are situations in life that are kind of shaking humanity. We have to change our attitude. And that is on a big scale. On the individual scale, we all know our <laughs> situations. Hmm? Someone else wanted to say something? <coughs> so, <coughs> if we simplify this further, Try to reflect on this, is our internal factors invite our external situations. No? And so if this is our mind, this is a picture of the mind. They might come out with a cell phone who can take pictures of your mind. <laughs> <coughs> In that mind, there are then many egos. No? Then this is like a little eye for ego. There is ego of job, there is ego of body, there is ego of uh, <coughs> relationship, there is ego of money, and there, there's ego of country and culture, and there may be one big ego that I am. I am the doctor. <laughs> and someone else may have a bigger ego. I am the wife of the doctor. <laughs> or I am the owner of the latest model of Tesla. And someone else may say, I am the friend of the owner of the Tesla. <laughs> Mind may be full with all these different egos. No, and someone may have another ego that they are very spiritual. Mm. <laughs> 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 
being spiritual is okay, but to create that ego, that is another trap. Hmm? <laughs> Does this happen in New York? <laughs> <clears throat> so there is a car, no problem. If there is that attitude of visitor, you use the car, you use it with appreciation, you use it with gratitude, you use it with the sense of um, uh, using it in a beneficial way, fine. But the moment I get into this I am mine and arrogance, I'm creating a wrong posture. So the moment I create an ego, there is as if a possible force, not there is a force generated that wants to nullify this ego. So to say, for example, that I have this big ego being a doctor. That ego will invite criticism, for example. That ego will invite situations that as if crunch this ego. No, I have a friend <laughs> and he one day he comes to and he says, Oh, he was so happy and so delighted. He bought the newest model of Mercedes. So he's on the clouds <laughs> for three months. And so one day he comes and he says, oh, Runa, it's really a bad day. Because one of his neighbors has bought the newer. <laughs> so his car is not the newest model anymore. Car is still very good. Car is still one of the best that is there. But ego cannot stand that. Understand? So ego feels depressed. Ego is crushed. <laughs> Maybe this is at a deeper level what is going on. And the law of karma tells us we are visitors in this world. We get so many gifts but why do we get into this attitude of desiring and demanding and expecting and wanting an I and mine? Hmm? Arrogance. And if there is one ego, it will have one as if, what is it, pain mechanism that is invoked. But every ego has its own pain mechanism. And bigger the ego, bigger the pain mechanism. It can be that it is not acting right now, but sooner or later it will be there. Now is this a good, good news? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So, so it means we need to be, we need to be more wise about this. We need to be more wise about this. But actually, this is a good news because it means it is in our hands. Because if we drop the ego, what will happen with the pain mechanism? It will also go away. It will not be needed anymore. And I'll give an example of my personal life. But if I observe my life, I see many, many of these mechanisms there. But one time, this is another car example. <coughs> I, I had a car that was a bit old, um, almost 20 years. But it was working perfectly. <coughs> and I used to go with it to work. I used to do the night shift and the weekend shift with it. It would always be working. So one day I drive 
to work. And I get there together with a colleague who is in a new car. So he says to me, Rona, you really have to get rid of this old <laughs> car. <laughs> this <laughs> old car is not, uh, doesn't fit you and uh, night shifts, anytime it can do something, you should get a new car. He's in a new car, so he's trying to convince me to get a new one too. And I said, I don't need this, a new car. It works perfect. <coughs> He said, no, no, and he's trying. But I said, I don't need no new car. Look, this, it is working fine. I don't want to put my head into this. So we go the whole day, and for some reason, we leave together at the same time again that day. And he begins again to tell me <laughs> this car is looking very horrible, and it doesn't suit you. So I said, it is fine, and it always serves. So he gets into his new car, and it doesn't start. <laughs> so now my ego comes, and he says, and I say to him, why should I get a new car? Look at this new car, <laughs> and it doesn't start. My car always starts. <laughs> <laughs> Day and night, we can always, I don't need a new car, look at this. So I get in the car and it doesn't start. <laughs> and at that moment, he says, ah, your car always starts? And his car starts, and he drives off. And the car doesn't start. <laughs> Two hours, mechanic, calm people, they can't find anything wrong with the car. But it doesn't start, no matter what they do. So I go back in, in my office and I say, let me tr call a taxi. But thought comes, sit and meditate first. So I do that. And I kind of shift my consciousness, I completely come out of this car consciousness and my car consciousness and whatever, new car, old car, finish. And I finish the meditation and I pick up the phone to call taxi. But thought comes, let me try one more time. So I go out and I try and it starts. And I am convinced this was life telling me <laughs> the shift of consciousness. There are many, many examples I can tell. If I make a, r a wrong decision because of wrong attitude, money-wise, it always, uh, what is it? It always comes back to me. Another a friend of mine, this is a nice story also, a friend of a long time ago, she, sorry, I'm mixing two people, this is not a friend of mine, this is a colleague who talks about a, a, a patient of his. So this lady was in university studying psychology, and all of a sudden she gets a big inheritance unexpected from some far relative. A lady who was tremendously rich, having business in the UK, a furniture business, and with branches all over Europe. And she inherits that, that business. So she stops studying. Why she needs to study now? <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's rich. When she involves in business, she gets married, husband involves in business, and it goes well, very well. She rises up the social ladder, she interacts with the, the royalty and the aristocracy of uh, England, she has houses in the countryside, she shops where the queen shops. Life and she forgot who were her friends in university. So after about 10 to 15 years, things going well, the market changes, but also husband becomes ill and dies. 
And because of that situation, she's not able to manage this. She make wrong decisions. And, uh, and the market goes down, so she has to close store after store after store after store. And at some stage, she even has to go into debt. Uh, she has to borrow money because her lifestyle doesn't change. She has to continue to shop where the queen shops and uh, parties and uh, whatever. That goes on for a number of years until she has um, debts with eight banks. And she only has one apartment left in central London. And they are after that apartment, those eight banks. And then one day, she looks out of the window and she sees one of these homeless ladies with her with some uh, what is it grocery car and uh, full of things. And thought comes: if they come and want the apartment, I will pack my things and I will go on the street and I will change my address and tell everyone I live on. Regent Street. <laughs> Street. She calls that night the night of the death of her ego. Ego death has happened, she says. And she says that night was the first night in years that she sleeps well. The day, the morning after is the first morning that she wakes up and lots of pains are not there. Muscle and joint pains and stiffness, it is not there. And in the space of the days afterwards, many of her medical ailments or problems alleviate. But what is more interesting, three weeks after she received letters from those eight banks telling her that they want to come to some agreement. That they want to help her keep the apartment. And she is a bit uh, research-minded, she kind of curious, so she wants to know what is going on. These people were after my apartment, and now they all want to help me. What is going on? So she goes to them and she asks them, when did you change your policy? Before or after ego death? And they all changed their policy after she changed her policy in here. And she is convinced that she says that big shift in external circumstances happened because she made that big shift here. She was ready to leave it all behind and be on the street. Ego, that was huge, becomes zero. And the pain mechanisms also become zero. This is the deeper understanding of the law of karma. And it is not so uh, oh, I am smiling nicely to you, so you will smile nicely back. That may work some level, but many times it might not work. Because behind that smile there are intentions, there is an attitude and there is a consciousness behind. And the law of karma also works at that level. And, but, this also says there is power in your consciousness. There is power in your thought. There is power in your attitude. If we put it right and align it with the forces of goodness and the forces of benevolence that exist in the universe. If we align it, what you could even uh, say, with the forces of divinity. So maybe this is something to explore a bit more. Want to say anything? Can you see how this might work? 
Now, even in, in, in relationships, no, I've observed with myself, but I also see how stubborn we can be in this. No, some relationships, people, not necessarily intimate relationship, but people who you work with or people who you are involved with in certain projects. And how do you say it? They d we don't gel. That is how to say it. <laughs> you don't gel, <laughs> or there is not that chemistry, or something. What is it called? Bad vibes are there, or whatever. <laughs> and you, you just keep with it. You stay with it. You complain about it in your own mind, or to other people, maybe even, or you maybe even say not so nice things about that person. This one is always like this, or this one is always like that, and. And this can go on and on and on, and I've seen it with myself. But when I have the courage and the clarity to drop the ego and to truly be humble and to truly be appreciative and appreciate that scene as a gift from life, extra, when I truly do that inside, First of all, my energy is different going into the interaction. And things shift. It is magical, but we don't use our power of magic. <coughs> the spiritual knowledge even says we are made Our innate state of mind is a mind of benevolence, is a mind of peace, is a mind of the visitor who is full and complete. We are made with a pure mind. We are made, and in, in Christianity they say, you know, created in the image and liking of God. Means there is Innately, we are clean and pure, like God, whatever you, but then God also doesn't, shouldn't be having those vices. <laughs> hmm? <coughs> if we are in this state, we are aligned and we live in alignment with the forces of nature. And then nature will give us the best. And maybe, <coughs> you're asking, when was there a time that we were like that? <laughs> maybe. But there is a lot of wisdom behind all of this. And I'm just trying to give little nutshell of this knowledge. But can you? Long for something you don't know? If you have never seen, heard, or tasted mango, can you long for mango? Why do we long for peace? Why do we long for a clean, pure, unconditional love? Why do we long for happiness and, and, and freedom? Why do we long for harmony if we have never, ever experienced it? So even though it may be a long time ago, <laughs> and even though we might not remember the details, but there is this longing lingering. Must be, because at some stage, the being the soul had that experience. And maybe nature is telling us it is time to go back there. And that there is not necessarily a place, but that there is a state of consciousness free from ego. Get ego.
No, it doesn't just die. <laughs> no, in, in, no, what I'm trying to say is we have created a society and a lifestyle and a culture that feeds ego and that stimulates ego and that uh, and not because we are bad but because we are not clear about this and we are not clear about the consequences and so it is not because we are uh, vicious and devious that we but we have created a system of life that promotes this so it means I need to be conscious and aware and make an attentive uh, effort to not get into it. Even like now, and this is such a nice dynamics going on and, and there's so much attention and there's interest and it brings out within me also more uh, enthusiasm to try and explain it right. But this ego sitting there and saying, oh, you're doing a very good job. <laughs> and so if you start applauding, this ego says, see, you are so good. And then next week, I might not do a good job. <laughs> hmm? It is not a question of bad. It is a question of, is it useful? If this praise increases the ego, then it has consequences. Because if one day I don't get praise, then I will not be happy. And if somebody else said this lecture was useless, then I will be either annoyed or angry or sad. And none of those are useful. But if internally there, this knowledge is not mine. I have also received it. And I have benefited tremendously from it. Why should I create ego? If you all are appreciative of this, that is good. And if you're using it for yourself, that is even better. But why should I get arrogant about it? It was also gifted to me. And I should feel honored that I can be kind of an instrument to help others also receive what I have received. That is a healthy uh, uh, attitude. You can acknowledge, yeah, acknowledge and be grateful, but why create ego and this attitude, oh, I am so good and mine, mine, mine. And then next day somebody, because that is destined to happen also, not everybody will like. If there is big ego, that ego will be annoyed. Or somebody else, you praise or someone praise and someone else doesn't praise. That will annoy me already. <laughs> bigger the ego so I will suffer this up and down
two things. No? Maybe to clarify, we could also say pure ego. Ego, the word ego literally means I am. No? So to identify with something that is temporary, that we would call ego. But if I identify with soul, I am a spiritual being, a visitor here, that you could call pure ego. And that invites factors of uh, fortune. Whilst this ego of I and mine invites factors of misfortune. And of course, this is innately uh, a dynamic that goes on in human consciousness. But we have the choice to move here. And maybe nature is telling us it's time to move here. Coming to the true, the original identity of the self. And shift back into an attitude towards the physical world, towards life, that is more of gratitude and of extra, instead of needy and bondage and desires, but an attitude of internal fullness and giving. And then we would be living our highest potential. And then nature will give the, the, her highest side. Whilst at this moment, many of us are stuck and trapped in this. And we have adjusted to this. Many of us have even accepted this as, as that is how it is. But deeper inside, there is a longing that something is not completely right. Something else has to be possible. Um, why not experiment and explore? Oh, at many levels, there are many things. No, and if we can shift our attitude, if we can shift our awareness, we can still do all those things, but from a much more healthy state of awareness. And maybe that will invite factors of fortune instead of factors of misfortune. You crunch it a little, then at least <laughs> it will be <laughs> it will be less dominant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It, it, is, it is a journey, and I mean, this is much deeper than uh, I smile to you and you smile back. Uh, so, of course, we need to, and there are much more angles and aspects to this. And like I said in the beginning, I'm just trying to give a nutshell taste of it, but there are many angles. But I'll try to uh, explain it in a, another simplified way, hopefully. <laughs> So if a visitor comes, the visitor has his home. The visitor has his world and comes here. 
uh, even if you you take it in a more limited way you have your uh, you have your apartment or wherever you have your work you have your family and you have come here and you will be here for 2 hours or one and a half hour so you come here full you don't need anything from the meditation center you don't need chairs or well i hope not <laughs> so you come full you're okay you are happy you're uh, balanced you come in and then you come here and you have a feeling oh this is nice you appreciate you respect you respect the surroundings you respect the furniture you um, you enjoy you use but you don't need anything you're not becoming desperate about that chair hmm? understand <coughs> so if we could approach life in general every situation every scene of life every day in this consciousness that would be like the healthy internal posture but what happens to us even before we say this is very nice i like very much and then i want the moment i enter into this i want i lose this i want to own and what spiritual knowledge says this idea of owning is actually an illusion because as a visitor can you truly own anything so we have come in this world as spiritual beings and we receive this chair <laughs> this body to use to appreciate to respect to enjoy to use but we enter into this own now can i truly own it who owns this body nature very good and nature has given it to me to use and there is a certain manual also so if i use it according to the manual then it will serve better but at some time nature will or we will have to give it back whether we like or not like so i don't truly own even though i'm the only one using it but for some reason these egos have started to make us be convinced that we can own things and also own people <laughs> not only with family <laughs> but we have created that attitude of mine so when we stay in this we are safe but we cross this line and actually this is the moment that we move from peace into pain is not yet there but you become a little restless from feeling secure from feeling full to feeling needy feeling i may be deprived insecure of whether i may own or not and also when i enter into this everyone becomes a threat because i want what i want i may not get 
So simplified, and this is why meditation is so beautiful, is reminding yourself of your fullness and experiencing the fullness of the real self, a being of peace, a being with innately higher nature, a being that is innately full, a being that has the potential of joy and wisdom and freedom, a visitor, to remember and experience that again. That is what is meditation, so that we can shift from a, a beggar attitude towards life into a, what is the opposite of a beggar? A giver. Or a sovereign consciousness towards life. A mastery, self-mastery consciousness towards life. Does it make sense? <coughs> Time is going. <laughs> <laughs> we are already past time. Final question and then we will finish. higher being or the soul, the real self, is innately divine. I did not mention it because this is another topic, but within the Raj Yoga knowledge, God is also a soul, but a soul who never gets trapped into ego and therefore holds that original experience of peace always, of purity, of power, of wisdom, of joy. And innately, each and every one of us is like that also. Anyway, there is, we can talk all night, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so <coughs> what I would like to suggest for you to, to try and observe this in your own life. Now, when do I get into this... Uh, identification, this I and mine. And when you're in situations, try and move into a more humble state of mind and observe how it works. Drop the ego. Does it really matter if others don't know that you are right? <laughs> Does it really matter that you're not right? all the time, <laughs> but we always like, you know, get into that mode. So try and observe this within your own life. Drop the ego and observe, play with it and see how things shift. Okay, so let's close with a few moments of silence and uh, those who are here for the first time, again, extra welcome. Um, on the desk, there is a, um, what is it, uh, a, a schedule, so you could take the schedule for what is uh, what, uh, what we have coming, but also if you want to join the mailing list, that is also possible. So just for a few moments. Maybe introvert. And become aware of the self as a spiritual being. There is this body, but 
there's the inner being. Soul. The real self. Who is an invisible visitor. And we can use the image of a tiny star. in the center of the forehead. The real self is this tiny star the experiencer A visitor. A being. Innately. Divine. And as we go through the rest of the journey, we aim to play with this awareness, approach life in this perspective of an invisible traveler. Thank you. Om Shanti.